Hello, everybody. Welcome um, to our monthly Science of Alt Protein seminar, wherever you are in the world. My name is Amy Huang, and I'm the Associate Director of Scientific Ecosystems at the Good Food Institute. For those of you who are here for the very first time, welcome. The Good Food Institute is a nonprofit think tank. We are 100% driven by philanthropy, and our goal is to build a world where alternative proteins are no longer alternative. If you are looking to take a deeper dive into the science of plant-based fermentation or cultivated meat technologies, or just to get a better sense of what resources exist to support you, check out our open access resources, tools, and databases at gfi.org science. Now we are ready to move into our fantastic seminar today with Dr. Simon Hubbard. Um, our speaker today has been running a solo consulting business for almost four years, focusing primarily on the development and application of computational models in the cellular agriculture space. Prior to starting Upstream Applied Science, Simon spent time in the motorsport, high-tech product development, and technology consulting sectors. He has broad experience in computational simulation and mathematical modeling with a focus on fluid dynamics simulation tools and applications. Um, so there are lots that we are going to learn um, today. We'll talk about the number of factors that affect the yield of cultivated meat production and um, about techno-economic analysis models that, that help us um, better understand um, performance, cell behavior at scale. Um, and during today's presentation, Simon will dig into discussing various computational workflows that um, help us understand how they're being utilized to improve cultivated meat production yields. So with that, I will turn it over to Simon to get us started. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks very much for the introduction, I really appreciate that. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk um, about work that I've been doing for the past nine months specifically to develop modeling workflows, cultivated meat bioreactor yield prediction. Um, and this is a work package that was funded by um, the Good Food Institute's RFP from last year. So the intent really here is to focus on production cost um, in terms of getting cultivated meat products on the shelves uh, for consumers um, and really trying to uh, get to a place where we can try and make that cost as low as possible. Um, so I'll put a little image here of um, cultivated beef um, with some unknown costs on it. Um, that's quite an old image. If I'd had a more up-to-date one, given the recent news out of America, I would have picked cultivated chicken. Um, but the idea here really is to um, try and explore and optimize bioreactor design and operations so that we can maximize the yield of cultivated meat products and minimize the cost. So using models to predict production yield is a, in itself cost and time efficient way of assessing bioreactor design and architectures. They're very expensive to build, to operate and to maintain. So if you're looking to explore um, different designs, different architectures, doing that virtually can be um, very time and cost effective. So what I will do here is share the development of some modeling workflows of increasing complexity to try and predict um, yield for cultivated meat. So a quick high level recap of what some of the benefits of computational modeling, um, you guys may all be familiar to some extent. So um, it's a tool that's a process that's used across a wide range of industries. Um, I've grabbed a couple of images here just to kind of show you some diversity. So we've got a simulation here of the stress in an um, automotive component on the left and an image of solar load um, on a housing development over on the right. Um, so things that are really valuable from a modeling perspective are this ability to get information at a lower cost and in shorter times, as, as I've said, an abundance of data coupled with visualization. So here you can specifically see where the stress is in the automotive component and particularly where the um, high solar load is um, in terms of the housing construction on the right. Of course, with the benefits come some challenges. So things that you have to be careful around is how the accuracy of your prediction um, and tightly coupled to that is how complex your model is. Um, in general sense, if your model is more complex, it has less assumptions, so you can expect a higher accuracy. But that's coupled with an increasing need for uh, more computational power. 
So a couple of images and a, a kind of complexity scale um, on the slide here. Over on the left, you have simpler models that you can hopefully um, run and solve on your laptop. Um, and as you, as you have increasing complexity, uh, you might find you need considerably um, more powerful, high powerful computing architectures and clusters in order to run your models on. So from a perspective of cellular, agri cellular agriculture space, there's a couple of particular challenges around complexity, um, and that's due to two aspects. One, we have bioreactors to think about, and then the other side, we have cell behavior to think about. So from a cell perspective, just a couple of high level thoughts here over on the left. So when we have simple models, we can start to talk about the population of the cells, um, the rate of growth in the number of that cell population and the rate of uh, uptake of nutrients um, and amino acids and secretion of metabolic products of that population. Whereas something more complicated over on the right would look at modeling individual cells and how they behave over time. And that becomes particularly challenging given um, the complexity of modeling what each cell is doing internally and also the number of cells. Similarly, from a bioreactor perspective, we can look from a simpler perspective and just consider characteristics. So a couple here that are important are the mixing time. So the time it takes that bioreactor to mix um, the dissolved oxygen that might be transferred from bubbles or from the headspace um, or the mixing of the metabolic products from the cells. If there's some perfusion involved, where's the perfusion entrance and exit into the bioreactor? So it's important to make sure that the things uh, that all of the things the cells need and produce are, are mixed effectively. And also we, we need to make sure we have a, an effective mass transfer, particularly of oxygen from the gas in the headspace or bubbles that might be introduced from a, a sparger or aeration approach um, in order to make sure that the cells have sufficient oxygen that they need. So that's at the simple end. At the more complicated end, we could start to think about impellers that are actually moving and modeling the fluid dynamics there particularly, um, and also considering the motion of individual bubbles. Here we have a similar problem that we have with cells. We have a large number of bubbles. Each of them might deform individually according to their motion and their interaction with the fluid dynamics, and that will affect the mass transfer on a per bubble basis. So how do we want to approach that? So the workflows I'll talk through today start from the simple end. So we're gonna build on some existing um, frameworks that have a simpler description of all of these characteristics and then build on our complexity and our accuracy as we go along. Okay, so a good starting place is uh, techno-economic analysis or TEA modeling. So this is a high level technical models of bioreactor performance, cell growth and yield, which are coupled with economic cost models of the production lines. So um, there's a couple of images here from a reasonably well-known publication from 2021 by David Humbert. Um, and you can see here, we've got an architecture of a, a fed, batch, fed batch production line and a perfusion production line. And over on the right, we have a couple of graphs that talk to the two sides of this. So the graph on the top right is, with regards to the technical modeling of the yield in terms of an achievable cell density in wet grams per liter of cells as a function of bioreactor volume with some constraints here around oxygen, carbon dioxide and mixing that we'll get into in a little bit of detail shortly. And in the bottom, we have the economic side where we're looking to predict what the cost per kilogram taking that um, yield into account is again for volume for uh, bioreactors of different volumes. So what I'll be doing here is focusing um, on the technical side. So the top right graph uh, in terms of being able to predict yield and um, cell densities and not at this point getting into any of the economic and the cost side. OK, so expanding a little bit on um, some of the details from that David Humber publication, um, it was um, a great piece of work to get a good foundational understanding of all the different factors that are involved. So from a cell characteristics perspective, um, a lot of the information there is taken from um, Chinese hamster ovary cell data. That's just because there's a lot of data available um, in the literature that characterizes those cells. So they're often taken as a good representation of a mammalian cell line. 
You do find other techno-economic analyses that look at other cell lines, still reference Cho cell characteristics. So they're quite commonly used um, for reasons that we'll see as we go through. So from a very simple perspective, um, we can consider what the wet mass of the cell is, the rate at which it's growing, um, and then that can give us the number of cells um, in a batch as a function of time. And if nothing else was going on, we'd be able to get a yield uh, for a given cell mass over a particular period of growth. But one of the things we have to consider is some of the limitations to that growth. So what factors stop the growth um, and the conditions um, that cause that? So there's three levels of uh, three different aspects in terms of concentrations of things in the media. Again, these numbers I've shown here are from um, published data with regards to Cho cell lines. So we have a situation where the dissolved carbon dioxide concentration as a partial pressure needs to be less than 100 millibar. Concentration of ammonia needs to be less than five millimoles per litre and concentration of lactate less than 50 millimoles a litre. And so in order to work out what the concentrations are, we have to describe the metabolism of the cell. Um, so um, again, for Cho cell data, there's a reasonable amount of um, good information that allows us to build a stoichiometric reaction model. Um, so this is the catabolic part. I haven't put the whole anabolic um, reaction in as well, just to save some space. But just to give you the key idea that this tells us the rate at which the cells are going to be absorbing oxygen, glucose, glutamine, and um, producing ammonia, lactate, and carbon dioxide. So from a bioreactor perspective, um, we then need to look at the other side of the equation here. And one of the main drivers for describing bioreactor performance is to look at oxygen transfer rate, um, the rate at which the bioreactor is enabling oxygen to be transferred from the gas in bubbles or the headspace into the media so that it can then be um, consumed by the cells. So we need to be ensuring that that rate of transfer into the media by the bioreactor and its operation is greater than the rate that the cells will be consuming it. The rate that the cells are consuming it, we can get from this stoichiometric reaction and the number of cells um, at that point in the uh, batch evolution. So from a modeling perspective, this oxygen transfer rate's got two parts to it. It's got this KLA part, which is um, a mass transfer coefficient. It, just, it describes the efficiency or how effective uh, the bioreactor is at driving um, a transfer of gas, uh, dissolved oxygen from the gas to the liquid. And we've got this concentration difference. So if there's a bigger concentration difference than that flux, that transfer rate will be higher. So from a modeling point of view, um, what can often be done is to model this difference in concentration as a it's a log mean difference between the concentration at the top of, bio, of the bioreactor and, and the bottom. Um, and that's done from a mass balance perspective in terms of the components of the gas that are being introduced at the bottom from an aeration point of view and the components of the gas in the headspace as a result of um, what the cells are producing and is um, coming out of the um, media at the top. The KLA part um, is a little bit more detailed. And what you often find is that there's a kind of empirical or model equation used to fit experimental data. And a very common one I've put up here has got a number of components. It considers the power from the impeller um, and the media volume. So you've got a power per unit volume part. And then you've got um, a superficial velocity, which describes the rate at which you're um, in introducing gas, sparge gas um, from an aeration point of view. So the impeller power, again, comes from a different equation um, from a measured value. So what you would end up doing is characterizing your impeller experimentally in such a way that you come up with a power number for that impeller. And that tells you what the actual power is for a given um, RPM and for a given impeller diameter over here, D. So when you put these things together, the um, power per unit volume and this gas superficial velocity, you then have some model constants, A, B, and C, that you fit to known data. Um, so this is quite often done for previous activities, previous characterizations, um, predominantly for stirred tanks, um, where you then have um, your operating conditions described by your power and your volume and your superficial velocity, and you have constants fit to known or previously captured data. The other consideration we need to have is this mixing timescale that I touched on previously. So um, the idea here is that 
the bioreactor needs to mix things more quickly than they're transferred from the gas. So um, you need to make sure that the gas, uh, the oxygen that's transported from the gas into the media is then distributed throughout the media more quickly than it's coming in. So that it doesn't just hang around next to the bubbles or next to the free surface of the interface. Um, so the criteria here is this mixing time needs to be less than the reciprocal of this mass transfer coefficient. Now, mixing time um, is a longer equation here, but the principle is the same as for the mass transfer coefficient, where you have a bunch of data um, characterizing mixing times in known tanks uh, of particular um, dimensions and operations. And here we've got um, an equation that again fits to stirred tank reactors where we've got a bioreactor diameter, our power volume, media density again, um, impeller diameter, and a media height. So um, as you can see, there's a little bit of a trend here of using kind of empirical model equations fit to known data from measured um, bioreactors of scales that we're interested in. And the last element to consider is the hydrodynamic conditions in the media as a result of the bioreactor operation and the stress that they will put onto cells. So one way to consider this stress is to consider the smallest scale of turbulent energy dissipation in the media. Um, and that's related to the kinematic viscosity of the media and the rate at which turbulent energy is being dissipated. So what you would normally consider here is this maximum value of the, of the rate of dissipation. Um, and that again, fit to known data from previous measurements is often approximated as 50 times the mean value across all of the media. And this mean value is given by this power per unit volume relationship again. Um, so the idea here is that this smallest scale of turbulent energy dissipation needs to be bigger than the characteristic dimension of the cell, its diameter, um, such that the thought process goes that if energy is being dissipated at a scale that the cell doesn't experience, um, then it won't be experience any stress as a result of it, and it will continue to grow and divide. Whereas if the energy is being dissipated at a scale similar to the cell scale, its diameter, then it experience some of that energy dissipation and it may be stressed and cease to grow. There's also an equivalent characteristic here, which instead of focusing on the um, stress as a result of the impeller motion, uh, we've got a stress as a result of bubble velocity. So here, what we think about is a superficial velocity at the top of the bioreactor. And that's given by the um, superficial velocity that we've specified in terms of our sparging characteristics added to the rate of secreted gas. So primarily here, we're looking at carbon dioxide, um, which then is um, transported from the media into the bubbles and increases their speed um, as you get towards the top of the media. For this perspective, there's a, um, a kind of rule from literature values, again, that says this value should be less than six millimeters a second. And just a quick touch point, all of those things were talking about fed batch process from a perfusion process. You would add a perfusion rate to your bioreactor characteristics, um, which would then tell you the rate at which you would be removing um, ammonia and lactate. Um, from your media, which you would combine with these limits um, and the production rates from your stoichiometric reaction that describes your metabolism. Okay, so we've got quite a lot there. Um, just a bit of context. This is us trying to start from the simple end of the modeling scale. So we've still got a reasonable amount of complexity uh, to wrestle with. Um, but when you put all of those equations together um, and solve them, you end up with output that looks like this. So you have a situation where you have some initial cell density here for a 20,000 litre stirred aerated tank operating a fed batch scenario. Um, and the rate of increase of the cell density is driven by our growth rate equation. Um, and then we can also work out the rate of increase of lactate, ammonia, um, dissolved carbon dioxide, given the metabolic reactions um, that describe the, um, the output of those um, metabolites. And so here we can see that we've stopped off 48 hours because our ammonia concentration has reached five millimoles per litre, which is the um, limiting concentration that we've specified. And so we've got an overall 
output of uh, yield of seven grams per litre wet. So this is generally quite a low yield, certainly lower than a lot of other TEA studies. Um, and this was uh, one of the points made um, in David Humber's publication, which was this is a limitation as a result of um, metabolic efficiency of the cell. So you can then look at different metabolic efficiencies with different reactions that describe um, the cat catabolic and anabolic processes. Um, and then what you find is that you can grow for longer because you don't emit at the same rate as some of these products. So there's a lot to think about in terms of whether you would like to look at the um, cell metabolism and you focusing on that in the perspective of a yield increase or whether you would like to think about some of the bioreactor characteristics. Okay, so that was a particular um, individual run. What you can do is then repeat the run of that model, but change your bioreactor operational characteristics. So what these graphs here show is, uh, in each of the x-axis, we've got uh, the agitation, so the RPM of the impellers on the x-axis, and then the y-axis is our superficial velocity of our um, sparge gas from an aeration perspective. Uh, top left, we've got the overall yield. So that's the um, uh, basically the yield according to the lowest constraint out of all of the things that we've looked at. And that's driven by this ammonia concentration that you can see over on the right. Um, so this yield doesn't care about the um, bioreactor operation in terms of aeration rates and agitation. Um, that's just a you know, kind of flat level that you can't go above of around seven grams per litre wet for this particular metabolism. Um, so that's why we see this big, wide ranging flat region over on the overall yield graph in the top left. And we can look at a similar thing from a lactate concentration perspective, again, because it's a metabolic product concentration. It's independent of bioreactor operation, um, slightly higher yield. But because we've run into our ammonia yield before our lactate concentration yield, that's the one that's driving the overall uh, capacity here. Now, the bottom three are a bit more interesting because they focus specifically on um, bioreactor operation. So here we've got our oxygen transfer limitation, um, which we can see varies within this space, again, for carbon dioxide and mixing. Interesting things to pull out with regards to why we see this, these two cutoffs for a given superficial velocity and a given RPM, they're driven by these growth limiting stress conditions. So the first one, which was our um, turbulent dissipation energy length scale, that having to be greater or equal to the cell diameter sets here a limitation on our maximum dissipation rate. Uh, using the uh, correlation to the average value sets a limitation on the average value. This average value of dissipation rate sets a limitation on our power. And for a given power number, that sets a limit on our RPM. So we've got a very hard limit here of just around 44 RPM due to this constraint. Uh, we have a similar picture with regards to the superficial velocity. We can't go above around four, uh, four and a half millimeters a second, because when we add the rate of secreted gas, primarily CO2 to that, that will take us above our six millimeters a second constraint. So we have this region in the bottom left of this parameter space, um, which, which we're forced to operate in as a result of these two constraints. But the nice thing we can do is we can then look at what our maximum potential yield is purely from a bioreactor performance perspective. So forgetting about the ammonia and the lactate concentration constraints, because they're driven primarily from a cell metabolism point of view and start to then explore how we might use this tool to then increase what our yield limits are from each of these different bioreactor performance constraints. So everything I've shared with you so far was uh, an equivalent approach to that published by David Humbert. What I've done is um, tried to simplify the operation of that, uh, put it together in a Python module and that's available on GitHub. Um, if you would be interested in having a look, you can recreate um, the results that I've just shown um, and using the same modeling approach that I've just described. But in terms of using it to then focus on how to improve bioreactor performance, we've got a bit of a challenge here. So we'd like to be able to improve the maximum values of each of these different bioreactor specific constraints in terms of 
oxygen transfer, carbon dioxide concentration um, and mixing. But the problem we have is the um, TEA approach uses empirical kind of equations that have been fitted to known bioreactor performance for each of these characteristics. So for mixing time, mass transfer and turbulence, energy dissipation rate and scale. Um, so if we wanted to try and test out novel bioreactor designs in terms of architecture or a stirred tank with a different impeller design, we'd have to build prototypes of those, fit models of the form or similar form to that which we've been using, um, and then use that in the model. So that's uh, more expensive in terms of time and cost. So what we'd like to be able to do is develop um, an approach where we can predict these performance characteristics using other modeling techniques instead of having to go and do prototype, build, test, evaluate. Um, and thinking about this, this also drives some of the challenges that you see with using these TEA models. So I've just highlighted here this um, mass transfer coefficient and the uh, model approach uh, commonly used in TEAs and pulled out a couple of different approaches from literature publications um, and plotted the result of the interpretation of that equation on a graph for different bioreactor volumes. So here you can see that we've got one publication that's using a different power per unit volume, factor of four higher than the other one. Uh, we've got a superficial velocity that's based on um, 0.01 vessel volumes per minute gas flow rate, whereas this publication looks at something that's a factor of 10 higher and a different set of model constants. So it's quite challenging to then work out between these different um, studies, what does this bioreactor look like in physical terms compared to this one? Uh, and another one of the challenges here, particularly around the uh, superficial velocity, is that this model doesn't include anything um, with regards to um, the nature of the bubble size distribution and spider design. So how do we address that? So we can use computational fluid dynamics to help us here, and we can use um, these simulation tools to predict the performance of specific bioreactor designs. So to do this, there's a number of CFD software that exists both in the commercial landscape and the open source landscape. Um, the software approach that I've taken here is to use the commercial software MSTAR, which is particularly well suited for this application. Um, so this particular tool set uses a lattice Boltzmann approach for the fluid dynamics. It allows us to model the bubbles as Lagrangian spheres. So we're, we've got a uh, individual bubble modeling capability, but we're not going too far on the complexity because we're not uh, allowing the bubbles shape to change. So we're keeping them all as spheres. We're modeling the mass transfer of oxygen from the gas in the bubbles to dissolved oxygen concentrations in the media and how it's transported. And the numerical approach of the lattice Boltzmann equation is particularly well suited to solving on GPUs. Um, so we're increasing in terms of our need for computational requirements, but nothing too significant. Um, and for this particular set of physics, this approach gives us a particularly fast solution. Um, and there's also a good set of published validation data using MSTAR for predicting mixing time, impeller power, and oxygen mass transfer. So this video that we're looking at at the moment shows uh, the model in use. So in the picture over here, we've got a 20,000 litre stirred tank again with two different, um, two similar impellers, uh, Russian impellers. We've got a sparge rate of bubbles here, which are then rising uh, through the media and being distributed through interactions with the impellers. In the middle, we're looking at the concentration of dissolved oxygen as a result of trans mass transfer from the bubbles. And then over on the right, we're looking at our eddy dissipation rate, which is related to this cell stress metric that we've been looking at. So we can see here that the model will give us all of the outputs that we're interested in and allow us to predict those for a range of different geometrical inputs. So how do we pull that together? So from a mixing time perspective, um, we would run a model here where we would replicate depositing a dye somewhere in the bioreactor. Uh, and look at the evolution of the distribution of its concentration over time. So we'd end up with this uh, graph on the bottom where we're looking at the percentage relative standard deviation of that dye concentration, uh, and it's tending towards um, zero over time. And we would pick a value where we say things are sufficiently well mixed. So in these examples, I've said that once that uh, percentage relative standard deviation is down to 5%, we can consider uh, everything's sufficiently well mixed, which will give us our mixing time. In this instance, we uh, deposited the dye at 10 seconds. 
we got to 5% after 100, so we've got a 90 second mixing time in this case. From a mass transfer perspective, we can introduce a number of probe locations uh, down the side of the bioreactor, and we can record the dissolved oxygen concentration at each of those probe locations um, and follow a DECMA protocol that's commonly used in um, experimental evaluation of KLA uh, to look at the average value. Um, and then from that, we can look at the natural log of the um, deficit in terms of the maximum saturated concentration, which will give us the KLA value from the gradient of this curve. So we've got a commonly used approach uh, and protocol for using for evaluating mass transfer from a number of probes. And finally, um, from the top image here, we can see we've got a time evolution of the eddy dissipation rate, which um, is driving the cell stress. Um, and we can then time average that, which we've done in the bottom image, um, and then take the maximum value of that time average. Okay. So what does that look like altogether? So we've got all of these things that we had before from a technical economic analysis perspective, but we've removed the model equations. Um, and now we're just saying we're going to take our KLA value at mixing time and our maximum um, eddy dissipation rate directly from our CFD model and use the same architecture and the same code uh, that we had for the Python model, but we're just taking our inputs from different places and we can output our um, performance limited yield prediction based on our CO2 uh, concentration, our oxygen mass transport, and our mixing. But we can do a little bit more. Now we've got this set up, we can combine this approach with an optimization loop that will then take this yield value um, and change some of our parameters um, to then try and optimize and maximize the yield by changing a range of parameters that we can specify. So here, what we'll do is we'll try and maximize the oxygen uh, mass transfer limited yield. That tends to be the uh, most difficult criteria. That's the lowest yield limit out of these three. Um, so we will have a little activity where we'll let a Bayesian optimization um, routine vary a range of different parameters in the bioreactor and try and maximize this value. So when we think of an activity we could do here, so again, we're focusing on a 20,000 litre tank with a two to one height diameter ratio filled to 80% capacity. We've got two Rushton impellers. We're going to vary the diameter of those impellers between um, 0.7 of a metre and one metre. And we're going to vary the uh, widths of the blades between uh, 10 centimetres and 30 centimetres. Um, change the RPM. We're going to have um, a single ring sparger with a constant bubble diameter of two millimetres, which is reasonably common to tanks of this size. And we're going to optimize the air gas flow rate for between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1 vessel volumes per minute. So when we do that and we let the optimization routine go and explore that parameter space, we can see after around 10 iterations, it's reached a, a value that it can't subsequently beat of nearly 80 grams per litre of wet, which is uh, a nice little 10% or so improvement on what we saw previously. Uh, when we weren't able to do this level of geometric variation, given the constraints we had solely on our um, TEA type model. Okay, and we can see a similar picture here. So this graph on the left gives us um, the output from the optimization where we've got the same characteristics as we saw before. We've got what looks like quite a hard limit on the gas flow rate because we still have our superficial velocity at the top constraint, and we've got a hard velocity on the RPM at pretty much the same value around 45 RPM as we saw from the TEA model. So that's just a nice comparison because it suggests that our CFD predictions with regards to those um, constraints and predicting essentially the power number of the impeller is doing a very good job compared to the um, literature data that was used in the original TEA models. And we've also got a picture over here that says for this situation, we've got an optimum pallet diameter and an optimum blade width in order to achieve that particular yield. So one thing we can then have a look at, given how hard that constraint is with regards to RPM, we can explore that in a little bit more detail. So if you remember, we had this situation where we wanted to keep this length scale uh, above the diameter of the cell. Um, and that was um, a particular way of thinking about this element of hydrodynamic stress and it's quite nice because it gives you a very hard comparison so you have a length scale of the turbulence you'd like to keep that above the length scale of the cell so you have a numerical value to keep it um, 
to, to try and target from your modeling work. There has been um, published work that suggests that's not always the case. And sometimes it's better to think about just having a limit to this maximum dissipation rate of turbulent kinetic energy. Um, so if you replace this current um, previously used stress limit with a new one corresponding to other measured data with regards to um, turbulent maximum values of turbulence dissipation rate that CHO cells can withstand of 60 watts per kilogram, um, you can see that we have now much higher oxygen transfer limited unit. We're up to around 112 grams per litre wet, um, which is obviously a significant improvement. So it just shows how important this cell stress criteria and cell stress understanding is. Um, and more interestingly, having expanded the design space a little bit, in this case, we allowed RPMs to go up to 90 RPM and impeller right up to one metre. It looks like the optimum's off to the right outside our design space here. So even though by um, considering a potentially more representative um, constraint with regards to hydrodynamic stress and having seen uh, a nice improvement in our oxygen limited um, yield, it looks like in this case that we could probably have a higher value if we allowed our model to explore higher RPMs and higher impeller diameters. Okay, so now we've got this nice little workflow. Um, what are the sort of things that um, we can look at? So next on the list are to consider a, a broader um, stirred tank reactor optimization, including sparger characteristics here, a bubble size distribution and its potential evolution, depending on surfactants in the media. We can also consider alternate architectures such as airlift, so we can just have the model looking at um, emissions of bubbles from spargers and that driving mixing as well as mass transfer. And particularly interestingly, we can start to expand on the Bayesian optimization approach and consider a multi-objective optimization, which will look at both the cost contributions from aeration, agitation, and power draw alongside yield. So that starts to give us a little bit of an insight into the trade-off between operating cost with regards to providing higher powers um, versus the yield that we can get for that particular operating cost. Um, so in terms of utilizing this workflow, those are the sorts of areas that I'll be looking at um, subsequently. The other thing we can do is to try and expand our complexity and our uh, remove some of our assumptions a little bit further, considering the cell experience and the, the response of the cells to the conditions that it experiences in the bioreactor. So if you remember here, we had these um, two um, outputs looking at the uh, dissipation rate of turbulence kinetic energy in the fluid. Um, up until this point, we've been using this time average value, um, but the cells won't experience the time average value. They'll experience the transient value that we see on the right as they're moving around inside the bioreactor. Um, so not only will they not experience a time average value, you notice the peak value here for the time dependent uh, field is quite a lot higher factor of four or five higher than the time average value. So there's a magnitude effect in there, and then there's the time scale effect of what the cells would be experiencing. So what we can do in our computational model is we can include cells. Um, so I'll put a few here just at the bottom to show you the effect in green, um, and we can track how they move around in the bioreactor and what they experience in terms of this turbulence energy dissipation rate. So this is analogous to other published work that talks about these cell lifelines that's been used in CFD studies for fermentation applications. So here we can see um, we've got some bubbles from Asparja, we've got the impellers moving, the updraft from the bubbles starts to pull the cells up, uh, and then a few of them are caught up in and around the impeller region and start to get moved around as a result of the impeller agitation. Um, and after around five seconds, you can see they're quite well distributed. Um, and we can look at the lifelines here. So over that five second period, you can, um, record the uh, experience in terms of the dissipation rate um, over time for each of these cells. And you can see some of them have lowish values around five for a, a shortish period of time. Some have very short exposures to higher values. So you can consider a, st a sufficiently statistically significant number of cells following the fermentation application approach um, and then evaluate what the dissipation rate that the cells actually experience is. So um, that's not useful on its own, 
but the published work that was looking at moving away from this length scale description uh, also considered a particularly uh, focused experiment. So uh, what you can do is pass cell media with cells in through a very small uh, manufactured device here that's got a contraction down to less than half a millimetre uh, for a particular flow rate. Uh, and as you can see here, the eddy dissipation rate in this situation is very well controlled and doesn't change with time. So in a similar way, you can now pass your cells through this very well controlled device over time. And then having done this repeatedly in the lab, you can look at the effect of this experience on terms of the viability of the cells, their growth and their reproduction. So the output of this little model that I've just shown here is this graph on the right, where we've got very clear and distinct durations and maximum values. And so one thing that we can do for a particular cell line is to characterize it in this way in these uh, simplified, well-controlled experiments and be able to correlate uh, peak values and durations of dissipation rate exposure and use that to then feed back into the lifeline output from the CFD model uh, and drive that towards telling us whether those cells uh, will continue to grow uh, or, or will die or, or will go to sleep depending on their experience. The other thing that we need to have a think about is um, what different concentrations of nutrients uh, and indeed metabolic products the cell experience as it moves around inside the bioreactor. So I've, I've just grabbed a couple of images here from one of the last runs of the uh, one of the optimizations that I showed you and just scaled the dissolved oxygen concentration to show you that we've got a bit of a gradient and a bit of spatial variability, um, which is quite often in terms of large, often experienced in large scale bioreactors. Uh, we've got a lower concentration at the top near the bottom. Um, and the reason for that's probably given by the picture on the right, which shows the bubble distribution uh, and the oxygen concentration inside the bubbles. So as you can see, as they come out the sparge, they've got a high oxygen concentration. As they get moved around, they have a lower concentration. And because this concentration difference between the oxygen in the bubbles and the media is lower, you then have a lower transfer rate. So you have a lower value at the top. So essentially what this is telling us is this is the result of us targeting a uh, mixing criteria down to a 5% relative standard deviation. If we push that lower, we would probably see a more uniform distribution. So this is linked to how well we're mixing. Uh, but what we would like to be able to do is categorize that from a cell response perspective. So um, how does the cell behave as it moves around and experiences different concentrations, uh, in this case, of dissolved oxygen? So a way that we can do that is to use genome scale metabolic models. So um, these describe gene protein reaction associations for the metabolic genes in an organism. Um, so it's quite a complicated process um, to construct these models. Uh, but once you have done that, you can then predict metabolic fluxes uh, from that model. So I've got a little example over on the right based from uh, a Python output. So there's a, a framework called Cobra Pi, which allows you to load in um, and get results from um, particular gems. And here again, I've pulled in a, an industry published um, Cho cell genome scale metabolic model solve for it, and then it will give you your uptake fluxes of glucose, glutamine, oxygen, and secretion fluxes of the things we've been talking about, lactate, um, ammonia, and carbon dioxide. Uh, but the nice thing here is you can then specify bounds to some of these fluxes. So here we're saying, okay, we're going to limit the oxygen uptake flux to a particular value, rerun the model, and we can see uh, the differences here. So the old values on the left, new values on the right. We've reduced our uh, uptake flux of oxygen that's had a little bit of a consequence on the uptake of glucose um, and a little bit of a consequence on the secretion of um, ammonia so this is quite a nice way of then being able to describe a cellular reaction to a concentration the challenge with coupling that from a computational fluid dynamics perspective is that we would like to be able to do this type of calculation for every computational element in the model for every time step that it simulates. So I've just given you a quick overview of some of the resolutions that we've used for the uh, previous CFD models that we've been looking at. And you can probably see that 
in a situation where we would have to run a model like this in each of these elements in each time step of the computation would make it very challenging and very time consuming. So a current activity that I'm working on is trying to um, develop a reduced order model that allows us to describe with a relatively simple equation what the uptake rates are and the secretion rates are based on local concentrations. And the other thing that we need to do as well is also bring in a kinetic model because the CFD is talking in terms of concentrations. Uh, the GEMS model is talking in terms of fluxes. So we need a kinetic model to give us uh, our bounded flux given the concentration of oxygen that the cell is experiencing. Okay, so quite a lot there in terms of building on TEA models, incorporating some CFD and some genome scale metabolic models, whereas that got us in our little landscape for increasing model complexity to predict yield. So we started with a simplish TEA workflow over, over on the left that's fast, you can run it on your laptop. It requires known bioreactor performance and cell characteristics. It assumes constant cell experience and response and assumes constant and spatially uniform media distributions. We've expanded on that a little bit to then bring in CFD that says, okay, we need to run CFD models, so we require some moderate hardware. I talked about running on GPUs. Here's a picture of the workstation that I've been using with a couple of GPUs in it. So this now won't run on laptops anymore, but we still don't need extensive computational capabilities. And that allows us to specify bioreactor geometry and operation conditions directly rather than using models fitted to known data. We still need cell characteristics and we're still assuming constant cell experience and response and we're still assuming constant and spatially uniform media distributions. Um, so the thing that I'm now working on to try and expand some of these things is to couple CFD with genome scale metabolic models, still within scope for running on um, the computational hardware, but at the upper end of what's possible. Again, um, we can run on moderate hardware. We use the CFD approach we did before that will take bioreactor geometry and operational conditions as inputs. Uh, we would now need uh, a gem model of the cell line that we're interested in and a particular cell stress response um, similar to the characterization that I've just described. So I just wanted to flag those two things particularly with regards to things that are super valuable as inputs into these models to be able to predict yield accurately. We saw the sensitivity of the optimization to the cell stress response um, from a turbulence dissipation energy rate point of view. So being able to characterize that well will be important in terms of allowing these models to predict um, accurate values of um, optimized yields. And then with regards to looking at the cell response and coupling that to the distribution of oxygen um, and potentially nutrient profiles in the bioreactor as well, we would need to have a genome scale metabolic model for the cell lines that we're interested in. Um, a couple of points here, there is an existing project within the Cultivated Meat Modeling Consortium to build a cultivated meat gem. Um, and there are some that are available in the literature, but they're not particularly well validated. Um, but I then did want to mention, uh, in addition to Amy calling out at the start, um, this year's GFI request for proposals has a particular strand focusing on cultivated meat gems. So uh, that plays very well into the development of these types of workflows that try to remove some of these assumptions around constant um, response and constant distributions. Okay, so thank you everyone for your time and attention. Um, thank you particularly to GFI for funding this work um, and for giving me the opportunity to share it with you today. I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so very much, Simon, for all of your tremendous work and for sharing these findings with our audience today. Um, we can go ahead and stop sharing your screen so that folks can see your face um, up close and personal as we dive into the Q&A section. Um, so for those of you who haven't yet gotten the chance to do so, if you have any questions for Simon, please do drop them into the Q&A section of your Zoom bar. I know there was a lot of information there for us to dive more deeply um, into. So um, feel free to go ahead and drop those questions in. I know we have a que couple questions there already. I might start with one of um, my own. So thank you again. I am fully convinced on the tales of this presentation that computational models can help us 
um, do this translational step of, of um, moving from observations into an anticipation of future events, um, create a really valuable testbed of ideas. Um, I know that computational modeling is, you know, much like any other technology, models can inform or they can mislead, they can be really well applied or they can be misapplied. Um, so just out of curiosity, um, in your opinion, as you zoom out on the whole of the cultivated meat space, where do you think computational modeling can be reliably useful um, versus when might they lead us astray? Okay, let's so start with the tricky questions, hey, Amy. Um, so um, I think it, it has potential to be very useful. Um, the things that you would have to be particularly careful of, um, and I tried to lead towards that in the presentation, was having a very good understanding of everything that the model is doing. So as I hope um, you saw from the presentation, we've got a reasonable amount of complexity to consider, um, and we've got a way of modeling that complexity but our input space is significant. We've got bioreactor geometry, bioreactor architecture, bioreactor operation, cell metabolism. So um, the thing that's always important is having the most appropriate inputs. So that would be the area where I'm most cautious at the moment. I think from a, um, and I'm slightly biased here because my background is more heavily weighted towards computational fluid dynamics than cell biology, is that my sense is that the, uh, input characterization from a bioreactor perspective is relatively straightforward, um, but as a as you'll see in the presentations, having to use Cho cell data, I don't have a strong sense of how representative that is of a particular cell line. Um, so it's quite commonly used in the literature, and I think that's it. it I've, people often cite it falling into it's a mammalian cell, so it's representative. It falls into that category, but I don't have a good sense of the variability within that group. So. That would be my area of concern. Some of that concern for me personally is because I don't have a depth of knowledge in the cell biology space, but just that general idea of, um, and I know it's a challenge with the industry, people sharing information about their cell lines. Um, it's not something that uh, is very easy for them to do, but that would be the area where I would, it would be, um, it would be one of the main areas, I think, that would drive more confidence in this approach if we could have a more thorough and well understood and open understanding of the cell biology inputs into these models. Totally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I know, that as you've spoken to, modeling is most useful when there are quality, large scale data sets for us to be working with. And my understanding is that, you know, the availability of such data sets in the alternative protein space are quite scarce. Um, if you could just kind of like wave a magic wand um, and um, I guess, create the right dynamics such that those data sets would exist. This is maybe the worst possible way to ask this question, but just what would that set of dynamics look like? Like what would need to change in order for those data sets to exist for us to fully tap into the power of computational modeling? Okay, um, yeah, that's a challenging one again. So I guess um, my sense is um, a lot of companies that are working on their own cell lines for their own cultivated meat products are not incentivized to share those details, um, kind of very IP specific. So um, I, I don't know if this is possible, but if there was a way for people to um, characterize relevant cell lines that they might not be working on themselves. So um, there's a good example recently, a couple of companies in the UK have collaborated um, extracellular and multis to then have a kind of a cell bank resource, which enables researchers to access particular cell lines um, at much lower costs than uh, were required previously. So with that availability, then if there was a possibility of using those cell lines to build a gen model, to do some analysis that would um, characterize response to cell stress, um, and they wouldn't necessarily have to be cell lines that were being targeted by any a startup or any company that was moving towards cultivated meat product. But from my sense, they would feel a lot more tangibly close to that cell behavior than show cells. Um, somebody who's got a stronger cell biology background than me might be able to make some good arguments of why show cells are particularly close or not. I don't have that context. So uh, that example for me would be something that maybe there could be a middle ground of. Um, cultivated meat specific cell lines that weren't necessarily associated with any particular um, 
startup or um, sell line product development at the moment that would then start to expand that knowledge and that information space. Awesome. Thank you so much for letting me throw you some hard balls. <laughs> We will move over to our audience questions now. Um, the first question here um, is whether the lambda k equation is the same as the Kolmogorov length scale, um, namely the scale of turbulent energy dissipation. Apologies for the <laughs> mispronunciations that are sure to unfold in the next 10 or so minutes from my end. Yeah, so the, the short answer is yes, it is. Uh, I should have been a bit more explicit. So um, the the background to this is Kolmogorov's um, hypothesis of isotropic turbulence, where for a given energy dissipation rate, you can use that equation for lambda k, which tells you the smallest scale of turbulent motion for that average energy dissipation rate. Um, so one of the approaches that has been taken with using this direction with regards to cell stress is to then change that a little bit. And instead of talking about average energy dissipation rates to talk about maximum values and then substitute that into the same equation to get this particular length scale. Uh, I don't think, um, I'm not 100% sure that's completely in agreement with Kolmogorov's original hypotheses when he developed his theory. So it's, um, it's one of those areas where it results in a nice and relatively straightforward numerical comparison that you can make in terms of a length scale of turbulence according to a maximum uh, dissipation rate, and you can compare that to a cell diameter. Uh, I think it might not be um, completely correct from a turbulence modeling um, fundamentals perspective. So my sense is that um, the approach of considering the experience of the cells from a energy dissipation rate perspective directly without looking at these length scales might be a cleaner way of doing it um, and there are ways as I showed to then directly correlate cell experience through particular experiments and the modeling of the energy dissipation rate in that way. Thank you. Um, a question here about MSTAR software. Um, do you know if the MSTAR software supports modeling of non-stirred tank bioreactors such as rocking bed or airlift? Uh, yes, it does all of those things. So I've used it here just for stirred tank, um, but you can describe um, a variety of different motions. So you can do rocking beds in it. You can do airlift in the, in essentially um, it's the same way that I've done. You would take the impeller motion out of my models um, and you would just drive the fluid motion as a result of the um, influence of the rising bubbles, driving uh, an upward motion in the media uh, in alignment with the bubbles as, as they rise. And interestingly, you could see that if you go back and look at a couple of the videos, particularly with regards to this um, turbulence energy dissipation distribution around the impellers, you can see the effect of the rising bubbles on that. So that's some of the extra dynamics you get here. Sorry, I'm going a little bit off piece, but yes, um, you can use MSTAR to do a variety of different bioreactor modeling. That's really one of their target markets is the um, pharmaceutical and biotech space. So a range of different bioreactor operational modes are simulated by that software relatively straightforward. Great, thank you. Um, can you share a bit more about how to approach bioreactor geometry variability in these models as you scale and de-risk man manufacturing designs from pilot to production? Yeah, so that's challenging. So um, the approach that I showed here was trying to take a step back and just think about it from a very first principles modeling point of view of, OK, I can change my impeller geometry. Um, but there's a very wide range of different impeller geometries that exist, particularly more at the lab scale. Um, and a lot of them have been characterized experimentally where they have the power numbers. So the critique that I made of the techno-economic analysis models that says, if you want to develop a novel impeller geometry, you'd need to test, uh, build it, build a prototype, test it and calculate it. From a lab scale perspective, there's a very wide range of different impeller geometries, um, and a lot of them have all, already been measured from, from a power number perspective. So from a lab scale approach, um, and everything that I've showed today is equally applicable to a um, one litre, five litre, 10 litre. I just happen to concentrate on the 20,000 litre example because that's more relevant from a production scale perspective. 
um, but everything that I've shared is applicable to the lab scale volumes. Um, so from that perspective, my critique of TEA is probably slightly unfair at the lab scale end, given that there is a very wide range of different impeller geometries that already exist, lots of different designs, lots of different ideas with regards to essentially the same performance criteria. How well does it mix? You want to mix as well as possible. You want to um, make sure that you're transferring oxygen as effectively as possible from the gas into the media, but you want to keep your stress down. So they're all trying to um, address that balance. Um, and a wide different of a wide range of different designs with performance characteristics are available. So from a lab scale perspective, um, there's a number of companies that have got a very large list of impeller designs characterized with, with uh, power numbers. So um, that's a that would be a good place to start. And my sense there is that people with um, hands-on experience would be super valuable in navigating that space. Um, I wouldn't like to take the task of using all of the different available impellers with all of their different power numbers in the model to see what was best. There's going to be a lot of um, hands-on experience of people who have used them for growing cells in the lab who can point in the right direction. So as always with these things, um, modeling can help a lot. Um, you can make a lot of progress in the lab as well. But for me, when you put those two things together is when you end up with the real benefits of both approaches. So that sort of activity, I think, would be um, well suited to um, people with lab experience or done in um, association with lab experimentation as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Simon. There's a question here um, about whether the values for metabolic limits need to come directly from genome scale metabolic models or if they can be derived from other lit values. And some of the broader context here is that this audience member is interested in how the new publication in Frontiers in Bioengineering and Biotechnology from the MOSA Meat team um, might be able to use to uh, be used to overcome certain limitations. Um, I guess it's a publication on non-ammonia genetic, nope, non-ammonia genetic media from MOSA Meat scientists. Right. Okay, so that publication feels like it's tending out of my knowledge space, so I'll, I'll tread carefully. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a great question because that was one area that I didn't address directly here is what those um, concentration limits are. So um, in terms of the developments that I talked about were areas where you can start to overcome some of the assumptions and some of the uh, modeling approximations for uh, meta using stoichiometric reactions for metabolism of CHO cells, which you can use GEMS for. Um, I think there's, from my limited biotechnology knowledge, I would say that there's maybe an angle for doing a similar type of experiment where you're specifically controlling the um, turbulence characteristics from a st stress point of view. I don't know if there's an analogous way of doing a similar thing from a um, metabolic concentration limit to look at lactate ammonia uh, dissolved carbon dioxide so um, that was an area that I didn't focus on because that falls more into the metabolic engineering from a cell line perspective um, which wasn't my focus so I was looking on uh, yield improvements from bioreactor performance um, so I kind of um, separated from the cell metabolism direction which is also important um, so my idea here was to try and push the bioreactor boundaries as far as you could, such that when the metabolic work is, is kind of performed to improve efficiency from that point of view, the bioreactor isn't getting in the way. But again, I would make the same argument to the previous question, which is those two things are probably best thought about together. I've diverged a little bit just so that I can focus on the modeling from a bioreactor perspective, but bringing those two things together and looking at them um, in that TEA model was, you know, these models that I've talked about, it would be a nice way to think about both of those things together. Um, from an optimization perspective, it's not super helpful because as you saw early on, um, it didn't really matter what you did to the bioreactor operation, your ammonia and lactate limits were standard anyway. So the optimization would just say, increase your ammonia and lactate limits. Um, it's not really very helpful because you don't, the model then doesn't tell you how you would go about doing that. So that's where some of the cell biology and knowledge in that space would help um, understand and make those improvements. Thanks for those perspectives, Simon. 
Um, there's another question here on modeling approaches that might allow us to determine the levels of mole molecular interactions in the bioreactor. Would you like to comment on that? Ooh, okay, so um, I'm not sure the context for molecular interactions. So at the moment, the modeling scope really considers um, rates of uptake and production um, of amino acids and metabolic products. It doesn't scope into modeling molecular dynamics in any way. Um, now, you could integrate that in some way into the model, but you would be you'd find it challenging to do that level of modeling on the bioreactor scale. Um, so one of the pictures I showed at the end was talking about the challenges of including the genome scale metabolic models was the spatial resolution of the CFD model of the bioreactor and having to do a lot of other maths for each of those small elements. Um, if you were then to take that kind of space dimension down to the molecular level, your computational load is going to go up significantly. So if you wanted to get into that level of detail of modeling molecular interactions, you would need to do it in a way which was slightly uncoupled from the full computational fluid dynamics, just because of the challenges of capturing that very small scale, both in terms of space and time, and coupling it between molecular level activities and bioreactor activities. So bringing those two things together for me would end up far over on the right of my complexity graph, complexity arrow, and you'd be into supercomputer requirements to do that. Not to say that wouldn't be valuable, but you'd need to understand that value proposition quite well before you started making um, efforts and um, expenses to buy lots of computers. That makes sense. Um, there's a question here on um, what we believe was called the DeChema experimental protocol. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, could you explain what that experimental protocol yeah. does? Yeah. So uh, that's one way of measuring this um, mass transfer coefficient KLA. So what you do is you um, uh, you remove all of the dissolved oxygen from your media um, by usually bubbling through um, nitrogen bubbles or bubbles of a different gas that then take all of the dissolved oxygen out. So the opposite direction that you want to work in when you've got cells. So you need to remove all of the dissolved oxygen concentration from your media. Um, and then once you've done that, you can then start to bubble gases through with air or just pure oxygen in or some concentration that you know. Um, and then your probe locations would measure the rate of increase of dissolved oxygen um, concentrations. So that's easy to do in computational fluid dynamics because you just set the model up to say, initially, I don't have any dissolved oxygen concentration. Um, but that's one particular way of measuring KLA. Um, where you would remove all of your oxygen and then look at the rate at which it increases once you start to introduce it. There's other ways of doing it using chemical methods where you um, can look at visualizations in terms of chemical changes as a result of the rate of oxygen consumption. Um, so the reason I reference that, that DECAMA protocol is just commonly used in situations where you remove all of the oxygen um, and then reintroduce it. And then you look at the rates of increase starting from zero. Awesome, thanks for that explanation. Um, our last two questions come from folks who are newer to this field. Um, so the first question is, you know, coming from the perspective of someone who's new to biochemical engineering and fermentation, um, this person is hoping to get some clarification on the use of grams per liter measures versus R and Q rates and their use in determining metrics of growth and performance. Can you um, talk a little bit about the kind of accuracy uh, relative accuracy between these measures. Uh, sorry, can you just repeat those measures for me, please, Amy? Yes, um, and I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question myself, so we can feel free to ask Sean to clarify. Um, he's looking for clarification on the use of grams per liter measures versus okay. R and Q rates and their use in determining metrics of growth and performance. Okay, so I'm not familiar with the second uh, metric of R and Q. So I've used grams per litre wet just as um, a result of that being the uh, a common metric used in literature. 
and a common way of calculating that based on your um, equations of metabolism and stoichiometry. So I don't have a good sense of whether there's a particular weakness in using that metric, certainly from not from an experimental perspective. Um, I would say if from a computational perspective, uh, it feels very accurate and very robust based on um, chemistry, conservation of mass and all the other things that you would ensure to make sure that your values are accurate. Um, don't feel I've got the knowledge or competence uh, outside of that field to comp compare it to different approaches that may indeed be better than the metric that I've used here. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, um, someone is wondering, as, as an undergraduate student, how might you encourage or, or recommend that they get involved with research in this space? What kinds of education and training pathways might they be um, trying to undertake to most meaningfully contribute to the work you're doing? Oh, okay, great question. Um, I guess that's very kind of field specific. So if you were interested in a mathematical or, or engineering modeling perspective, which is my background, um, I would, I mean, it's a very easy thing to say. There's a lot of good um, publications that are openly available. Um, so particularly in this field, uh, with regards to TEAs, um, I cited David Humbert's journal publication, but he's got an open source access, uh, open access eng archive document, um, which is much broader and much more detailed and is 100 pages long, so it's not a light read, but um, I was incredibly grateful for that publication just because it's very detailed, both from a uh, techno-economic analysis modeling perspective which touches more on the chemistry uh, and some of the mass transfer that I've talked about but it also does a similar level of description with regards to constructing the uh, metabolic reaction equations in terms of uh, catabolic components anabolic components so if your um, interest is more biochemistry um, that's a great place to start um, and I would just I, I guess that would be I would I would recommend that as probably one of the first papers to read, especially if you're not sure which direction you might like to go in, because it gives you a good landscape across both of those uh, characteristics in terms of cell dynamics uh, and bioreactor performance to a good level of detail is very well explained, very clear. Um, and that might help people who aren't necessarily very clear on which direction within this space they might like to take. Um, and generally, I. I think people who can be more um, less specific than me. So as I said, my background is very heavily computational fluid dynamics and less cell biology. So I struggle a little bit on cell biology. If my background included a bit of that as well, I think having people who are equally comfortable in both of those um, academic spheres would be super helpful to the industry as a whole. So um, if people are thinking about um, furthering their careers in education, I, I would encourage them to think about diversity as an element um, in addition to specialization. That is some pretty sound career advice um, to make sure that whatever skills you accrue are kind of broadly applicable. Um, I have dropped some links there in the chat um, to the Humber TEA that Simon was referencing, GFI's LCA TEA, and then also our Lit Library that has a bunch of open access, um, some not open access, but publications that you might want to dive into for some deeper reading. Um, Simon, I always like to leave off with um, just a little bit of space for you to comment on anything you would like to leave our scientific community with as you look forward into the future of cultivated meat. Is there anything you'd like to say to our global community of scientists? Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. I, mean, I guess from the perspective of um, what I've talked about um, in terms of getting the most value out of these models, um, it's something that I think really is benefiting of collaboration and communication. So if anyone's got any um, particular thoughts be very happy for them to get in contact with me I'm very happy to try and fill some of the knowledge gaps that I've got around the cell biology space and as I said before I think the greater benefit um, comes from combining uh, real world experiments from a modeling perspective so um, maybe your question wasn't trying to 
trying to be a bit broader than more what I would like from my work, but I'd love to see what I've done here have as maximum value in the field. And I think having um, cell biology inputs and filling some of my knowledge gaps um, and exposing it to real world situations would help it provide the most value that it can. Uh, and particularly given the wide range of things that we can start to think about. So, you know, I, you can change the geometry of your bioreactor kind of to whatever you might imagine and use these workflows to see if it's any good. So having people who've got experience of trying to do those sorts of things and trying to guide that really broad parameter space that we've got, both from a cell biology um, behavior and from a bioreactor performance, it really needs people with experience and knowledge to help guide it. So if there's any um, people in that situation listening that um, feel inclined to talk, I'd love to have more conversations around how to make this more directly relevant and more valuable to the field as a whole. That is the perfect call to action, Simon. Um, yes, that is exactly the kind of collaborative ethos that these forums are built for. So um, those of you who might have the right kinds of experience, um, cell biology experience and inputs to kind of offer up, please do reach out to Simon. Um, I would love to see more collaboration spring forth from this presentation. So thank you everybody for attending. Thank you so much, Simon, for your generosity and for doing this important work to advance the state of the scientific ecosystem for cultivated meat. Um, I hope to see you all again next month for our Science of Alt Protein seminar. And I've dropped the links in the chat to our RFP. Um, initial applications are due, I believe, on September 21st. So do watch the information session back, download that RFP, circulate it with your scientific networks. Um, we look forward to receiving your proposals. Thank you again, Simon, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody.